If I told you that in the mid-2000s, DC Comics wanted to pair up Frank Miller, writer of such acclaimed comics as The Dark Knight Returns, Daredevil Born Again and Batman Year One, with Jim Lee, one of the most iconic artists in modern comic books, together on a 12-issue Batman series, you'd probably think that that's an incredible idea, two insanely talented figures in the world of comics working alongside each other to craft what surely would be an era-defining Batman comic book story. Instead, it turned out to be the complete opposite. 2005's all-star Batman and Robin The Boy Wonder is regarded as one of the biggest and most catastrophic failures in modern comic book history, a floundering, incoherent mess that, in nearly three years of releases, fails to tell a compelling story, establish any real characters, or even have an actual plot or villain. Considering the parties involved in bringing this book to life, all-Star Batman borders on tragedy in its failure, and in this video, I want to talk about what happened and what went wrong with Miller and Lee's All-Star Batman and Robin, from its initial inception to the various problems that curbed the book's momentum to its quiet and shallow whimper from existence, and the legacy left by its flounder, and the cautionary tale of the goddamn Batman. So, before we dive into the actual story and behind the scenes problems with All-Star Batman and Robin, I think first I should just explain what the All-Star line of comic books actually was. In the early 2000s, Marvel Comics launched the Ultimate Universe, a series of new rebooted takes on the company's established characters, allowing new writers and artists to reinvent them and tell fresh stories within a modern context. Now, the Ultimate Comics proved to be a huge success over the next couple of years, and by 2005, DC wanted in on the action. As a result, the company announced their new All-Star imprint, a continuity-free series of books designed to allow for DC's most celebrated writers and artists to create new, iconic and standalone stories with the company's flagship characters. And when it comes to DC's best-selling characters, you know that Batman is going to be involved. In fact, All-Star Batman was fast-tracked with Jim Lee attached to draw the comic book, whilst his Batman hush partner Jeff Loeb was approached to write the series. Now, Jeff Loeb is a wildly celebrated Batman writer, both for his work on Hush and in the 1990s with The Long Halloween and Dark Victory. So it goes to show just the type of writers that DC wanted to bring onto these books, the best of the best, the iconic writers for each character. Unfortunately though, Loeb was actually in the middle of leaving DC for Marvel at the time, preventing him from working on the book. So with Loeb out the picture, DC instead took a gamble and hired arguably the most iconic Batman writer of all time, especially in the modern era, the man who had revitalised and redefined the Cape Crusader in the 1980s, Frank Miller. Frank Miller is a comic book legend, there is no question about that, but by 2005, his star wasn't shining quite as bright as it once had. You see, in 2001, Miller penned The Dark Knight Strikes Again, a sequel to his widely popular 1986 graphic novel, The Dark Knight Returns, which was overwhelmingly negatively received and pretty heavily criticised, partly for reasons we're going to touch on later. As a result, Miller was trying to bounce back from this failure and was given the chance to redeem himself and prove that he still had the same talents that had made him such an iconic writer two decades prior. Henceforth, he and Jim Lee set about crafting their new take on The Dark Knight, and the result was not what anyone could expect. With the mission statement of the All-Star series being no continuity and creator-driven books, Miller and Lee had pretty much free reign to tell whatever Batman story they wanted, and the pair ultimately chose to retell one of Batman's most quintessential and early stories, the origin of Dick Grayson as Robin and the birth of the dynamic duo. However, this wasn't going to be just a reskin version of the classic origin story for the Boy Wonder, as Miller insisted that this series will tie in with his other Batman works, making this part of the universe established in The Dark Knight Returns. This gave the book lofty expectations for sure, but with creative geniuses like Frank Miller and Jim Lee at the helm, what could possibly go wrong? Well, it turns out, quite a lot. All-Star Batman and Robin was a 12-issue series that took over three years to be released, and still never finished its entire run, being cancelled after the release of issue 10. 
Now, the artwork by Jim Lee, as a result of the numerous delays, is genuinely outstanding, and some of the best Batman artwork I've ever seen. But you'd think that with all this extra time, the story would at least be competent, right? To put it bluntly, All-Star Batman and Robin has no story. Not really, at least. There are characters in the book, and they do things, but there isn't an overarching narrative that pays off in any substantial way. Issue 1 of All-Star Batman, released in July of 2005, introduces us to the story's place within the Batman lore. The comic opens with Bruce Wayne and Vicki Vale on a date at a travelling circus, with the star attraction being the acrobatic family, the Flying Graysons. As you may expect, the Graysons are killed following their routine, shot down by aptly named mobster Jocko Boy Vanzetti. Bruce dons the cape and cowl as Batman as the police attempt to take the orphan Dick into care, crashing through the police car in the Batmobile. Batman then picks up Grayson by his collar and tells him, You've just been drafted into a war. In the following issue, we see Batman and Dick escape from the circus in the Batmobile, chased by GCPD officers. And this is where things start to get a little strange. For one, Dick is portrayed as literally being terrified of Batman. Meanwhile, Batman is physically running over police cars and taking them off the road, and doing so with a nightmarish grin on his face. In possibly the most infamous moment from the entire series, Dick asks the hulking psychopath who he is, and Miller, in his infinite wisdom, has Batman respond by saying this, which I'm just going to let you read by yourself. Within two issues, All-Star Batman and Robin had reached the point of parody already, and showed little signs of slowing down. Batman and Robin don't actually stop driving away from police until issue 4, where in the meantime, Black Canary is introduced as a bartender who attacks a gang of thugs before departing on her own heroic adventure, and Superman comes home to read a newspaper reporting of Batman's kidnapping of the child, his heat vision blasting through the page in anger. Which also raises the question of just how much time had passed during this period. It's also worth noting that by this point, All-Star Batman and Robin began to experience severe delays in its release schedule. Issue 4 hit shelves in May 2006, but the following issue wasn't released for another 12 months. And while Jim Lee credited the delay to himself, stating that the taxing nature of the detailed artwork had put the series behind schedule, many did begin to question Frank Miller's long-term vision for the All-Star Batman story, if he even had one. Miller introduces the Justice League in the following issue, made up of Superman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern and Plastic Man, who discuss Batman's reckless actions towards the child, while Bruce brings Dick back to the Batcave and instructs him to kill and eat rats found in the cave for food, and when Alfred discovers this, chastises Bruce for his poor treatment of the youngster. This issue almost feels like Miller doubling down on the maligned rendition of his DC universe, in the face of the many critics that had grown out of such moments as the goddamn Batman. For example, when we first see Batman in issue 5, he's laughing manically and yelling to himself, I love being the goddamn Batman. Strangely, the Justice League as a whole never come into any conflict with Batman in the story, though the dynamic duo do face off against Green Lantern, where Robin fully commits to the lifestyle of the Dark Knight, almost killing Hal Jordan before Batman intervenes. This moment does serve as a realisation to Batman that he may have pushed Dick too far too soon, and didn't allow the child to grieve over the death of his parents. In fact, issue 9 actually ends with a touching sequence where the pair visit the Grayson's grave, and console one another over the loss of their parents. We mourn lives lost, including our own. It's actually a nice emotional moment within the absurdity of Miller's overall story. Meanwhile, in the last few issues, the comic introduces us to the Joker, who is revealed to have been behind Jocko Boy Vanzetti's murder of the Graysons, though this Joker has a giant dragon tattoo on his back and never actually smiles in the entire book, and also never meets Batman or Robin either though he does briefly encounter Selina Kyle, aka Catwoman. Likewise, Barbara Gordon is also introduced in later issues, as a young girl inspired by Batman to become her own vigilante. But again, we never actually see her interact with Batman or Robin. 
Clearly Miller attempts to introduce us to as many elements of the Batman lore as possible, but they rarely ever cross over or have any actual consequence or meaning on the overall story that he's trying to tell. Maybe part of that is down to the fact that the final two issues were never released. After DC decided to pull the plug after countless delays had pushed the book almost three years behind schedule. Regardless though, All-Star Batman and Robin is a convoluted, absurd mess that doesn't really go anywhere and leaves readers scratching their heads as to what this book actually means and tries to do. While the plot of All-Star Batman left much to be desired, one thing that's fascinated me about it is the deeper meaning that Miller attempts to craft within the comic. Frank Miller is definitely trying to make a transformative statement about the state of the comic book industry within All-Star Batman and Robin, but what he's actually saying and arguing gets lost in translation. I believe that All-Star Batman might be Miller's attempts at a love letter to the classic golden age of comics. It's worth noting that Dick Grayson's origin story, as first told in Detective Comics number 38 from 1940, plays out in a reminiscent way to how it does in All-Star. While the actual meeting between Batman and the orphan Grayson isn't quite as fear-inducing as in Miller's version, Batman does address Robin as a reckless young squirt and says he ought to wail on him for taking on a group of criminals by himself. A product of its time, sure, but there's clearly a sinister element to the original story that Miller and Lee attempted to deconstruct within All-Star Batman. Likewise, it's also true that in the early issues of Detective Comics, the books featured a more violent and ruthless Batman, one with little to no regard for killing criminals. Both in terms of the story and within actual DC editorial, the introduction of Robin served to humanise and ground the Batman character, with the hero becoming less vengeful and more of a paternal father figure. With All-Star's presentations of a hulking, overtly masculine and near-psychopathic Batman, could Miller be trying to say that Dick Grayson is Batman's anchor, humanising the Dark Knight, grounding him and making him a far more relatable character? However, I think the biggest problem that All-Star Batman and Robin has partly comes down to the fact that Miller wanted to tie it into his other entries in his Dark Knight universe. While it's true that being a prequel to The Dark Knight Returns and a follow-up to Year One makes expectations that bit higher, I think the problems really arise when you analyse this book next to Miller's last outing in The Dark Knight Strikes Again. I purposefully didn't touch too much on the plot of Strikes Again earlier, but I want to talk about how it presents Bruce and Dick's relationship and the ripple effects that it has on All-Star Batman. Now, Dick Grayson isn't present in The Dark Knight Returns, all we're actually told about him within the pages of the graphic novel is that he was at one point Robin, but left the role after a fallout with Bruce. However, Strikes Again attempts to offer a resolution. In this book, Dick Grayson, after being fired by Batman for his incompetence, undergoes an experimental procedure that gives him the ability to regenerate his cells, while turning him insane and becoming a nightmarish Joker-like figure who throughout the comic is seen mysteriously killing retired superheroes and stalking Carrie Kelly. At the comic's conclusion, Dick and Bruce come face to face, where the former Robin, who is wearing his classic costume, laments to Bruce on his mistreatment and neglect, which turned him into the monster he is. Bruce, however, shows little to no remorse towards his former aide, kicking him into a volcano and killing him. The fact that All-Star Batman and Robin serves as a precursor to this story and was Miller's immediate project after its release suggests that Batman's cruel treatment of Dick throughout the book is supposed to be a sign of the toxic nature of their relationship. Now, Dick's story could be seen as tragic, cast aside by the only family he had left after years of mistreatment and abuse, but Batman is our protagonist in The Dark Knight Strikes Again and Dick is the villain meaning we're supposed to empathise with Bruce and Carrie, not Dick. This puts into question just what Miller is trying to say in All-Star, who is right and who is wrong, Bruce or Dick Grayson. You could make the argument that while Alfred, Superman and many of the supporting cast in All-Star see Bruce's treatment of Robin as reckless, Dick actually comes to understand Batman's methods and eventually seeks to fight crime alongside him. Did the ends justify the means? Was Batman right all along? I'm honestly not quite sure, and I'm not quite sure what Miller wanted to say either. 
The failure of All-Star Batman and Robin is one part tragedy, one part comedy, and one part sheer confusion. It's clear that DC Comics had incredibly high hopes for the series, expecting Frank Miller and Jim Lee to create a smash hit that would serve as the era-defining Batman story that they had hoped. And while Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly's All-Star Superman, released around the same time, achieved this feat, All-Star Batman left a lot to be desired. I think the problems with this book overall is just the lack of clear focus and direction. Miller's persistence to stick by his prior Batman works ultimately dragged down the potential of All-Star Batman in trying to connect the dots between Year One, Dark Knight Returns, and The Dark Knight Strikes Again. The comic should have just been Miller and Lee presenting a fun one-off story about Batman and Robin, but it attempted to do a lot and ended up accomplishing very little. In the end, the legacy of All-Star Batman and Robin The Boy Wonder isn't one of a grand epic story or a transformative look at Golden Age comics, or a worthy prequel to the iconic Dark Knight Returns. Instead, it's a weird, garish presentation of an unlikable, borderline psychotic Batman and his adventures in tormenting a child into submission, while the world and many other characters watch on in horror. All-Star Batman and Robin has left behind a legacy, but it's not the one that Miller, Lee, or DC Comics had expected or had hoped for. The legacy of endless slurs, overly sexualized and aggressive caricatures of beloved heroes, meandering storytelling and constant delays, all served atop the final coup de grace that was the one line that people still remember. And although it is somewhat cliche to focus on this one phrase in particular, I honestly think that nothing quite encapsulates the problems with All-Star Batman quite as well as the goddamn Batman. Thank you so much for watching today's video everyone, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on the video and also leave a comment down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on Frank Miller and Jim Lee's All-Star Batman and Robin series. Do you like the books? Do you hate them? And what do you think the deeper meaning of the books was supposed to be? What do you think Miller was trying to suggest about the Batman-Robin relationship? Let me know your theories in the comments below, I can't wait to hear what you have to say as always. I also want to give a big special thanks to Scott from NerdSync for helping out with this video providing the voice of Batman. There'll be a link to his channel in the description, go check him out, he's fantastic. But if you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please consider subscribing, we make videos analysing the real life history of comics and movies and everything in between. There'll be some more videos like this one on screen right now that maybe you want to check out if you're new around here. You can also follow me on Twitter at Owen Likes Comics. You can find written versions of the videos just at my website, owenlikescomics.com. And if you want to support the channel financially, you can do so at patreon.com slash owenlikescomics. There'll be a link on the screen and in the description as well. But that's all for me. I will see you all next time. So until then, take care and keep reading.